Educators Lead, Episode 130. I can do a lot more good improving the school by being out and about in the cafeteria, in the gym, in the classrooms than I can uh, in my office. Anytime I had something where I just had to get some stuff done, I would grab a stack of papers or now I could grab my uh, laptop and I would just go work in a classroom while teaching and learning was going on. Welcome to Educators Lead, where we interview leaders in education to offer inspiration and practical advice to help launch educators into the next level of leadership. I'm your host, Jay Willis, and I want to thank you for subscribing to our show. This is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Educators Lead. Let's join my friend Jay Willis and get ready to take your leadership to the next level. Hello, Edu Leaders. Jay Willis here, and I'm excited to introduce our featured guest today, Dr. Jeffrey Zoll. Jeff, are you ready? Jay, I am so ready. I've been waiting for this moment my entire life, I think. <laughs> awesome. Dr. Jeffrey Zoll is a distinguished leader in education, currently serving as the Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning in Deerfield, Illinois. Jeff was a classroom teacher and coach in Georgia for 18 years before moving into school administration as a principal, district administrator, and school improvement specialist. Jeff has also taught graduate courses at the university level and has authored or co-authored many books, including including What Connected Educators Do Differently, Start Right Now, Teach and Lead for Excellence, Improving Your School One Week at a Time, and Leading Professional Learning, Tools to Connect and Empower Teachers. So that's just a brief introduction, Jeff, but tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, Jay, thanks so much. Um, yeah, you kind of hit the uh, highlights of my career. I started as a first grade teacher. I sometimes say that one unique thing about my teaching career my first year of teaching, I taught first grade. And my last year of teaching, which is my 18th year of teaching, I taught 12th grade high school English. So I feel I've run the gamut of teaching and learned a lot about the different ages of uh, kids and learners and teachers at the different levels. And uh, in my free time, I try to uh, keep kind of active. I, I run a little bit, ride bikes, try to play some golf and I like to go to some uh, musical events whenever I can see some live music. And uh just enjoying life up here in Deerfield, Illinois, assistant superintendent on a beautiful spring day in May. Yeah, I bet I bet there's a lot of activities to do right outside of Chicago. Yeah, that's great. I, you know, I do try to take advantage of every place I've ever lived. I lived for seven years on St. Simons Island, Georgia, mm. a small island between Savannah and Jacksonville. And and I uh, you'd, you'd meet some people who live there all their life and they'd say, gee, they never even go to the beach anymore. And I, I just never wanted to be that person. I always wanted to take advantage of places very important to me. And I've always lived in kind of cool places, I think. And no matter what place I've lived in, I've tried to find the cool within it. And uh, when I lived on St. Simon's, I never let a day go by without at least walking or driving by the beach and appreciating all that that offered. And Chicago offers so much. I try to take advantage of all the things cultural arts and history that's going on here all the time too so love to take advantage of what's available to us in this beautiful world right well so i guess what would be maybe something interesting about yourself that most people wouldn't know oh gosh i don't know if there's anything interesting about me let's see uh, <laughs> how about uh you know about uh, seven eight years ago i ran with the bulls in pamplona oh State. wow yeah that was kind of a lifelong goal i was a big Ernest hemingway fan in college and uh was sort of an English major, and and I always wanted to run with the Bulls a la Hemingway and did that, checked that one off my bucket list, and that's probably one of my uh, life's uh, most exciting adventures. Wow, and you came out okay from that. Yeah, I did that three yeah. days in a row. I forget how many days wow. I do it, like two weeks or 12 days or something during the festival, San Fermin Festival, and I did it three days in a row. It was, uh, it was fun, but I was scared. I imagine so. How close did you get to the Bull? Really Bulls. close. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's sort of the goal is to kind of get close and maybe even touch them as they go by. And uh, but they go by pretty quickly. So uh, and then the big advice they gave you is if you fell down 
to not try to get up because that's when people would really get hurt. They said it's, you know, one thing if you get trampled by the bull, that wouldn't be too bad. But if you tried to get up and got gored by the bull, that's when bad news happened. So my third day, I fell down and I knew I was supposed to stay down, but I, I couldn't take that advice. That scared me too much. So I got <laughs> up and started running again. So good wow. stuff. Though. I can't imagine that had to be so crazy. Wow. Well, so I guess, you know, for people who may not be familiar with your story, maybe if you could start from the beginning and talk about how you got to where you are today, maybe even, you know, what first got you into education and then go from there. You know, Jay, uh, like some other people I know, you, you, you often hear people going into teaching because they had an inspirational teacher that was a hero to them. And, and I sort of almost, although I had some good, you know, folks in my life as classroom teachers. To be honest, I didn't have um, a lot of teachers who inspired me and and really motivated me. And I, and I actually was kind of a rebellious student uh, for most of my life. And I just felt that learning could be a lot more fun than I was experiencing. And so I sometimes say it's not, I'm not super proud of this because it was probably my fault as a, as a learner back then and as a kid and a rebellious kid at that. Uh, but I kind of went into teaching because I thought I could do a better job and relate better to kids and make learning more fun. And uh, and that's kind of why I went into it. And and then that journey, uh, as I say, starting in elementary school and then I was coaching a lot at the high school. And then I moved up to the middle school in this large county district in Georgia and then eventually moved up to teaching and coaching at the high school level. And I taught for 18 years and was always going to teach for 30 years. And uh and then kind of the same thing happened the, that propelled me into school administration that did teaching. I felt like I, I hadn't practiced as a teacher under the um, leadership of a lot of great school principals, to be honest with you. I had some, and some were kind of mediocre and some not so great. And I, and I sort of said, gee, I think I could do a better job of that and went into uh, administration partly as a again, is maybe an act of rebellion that I thought I could do a little bit better job. But of course, as you enter teaching and entered school administration, then you learn it's a lot harder than you think. Yeah. And uh, I can understand the frustrations of others because I've had my own and my own difficulties. And I try to keep learning along the way, but it's uh, it's always a challenge. This is tough work we do and rewarding work we do. Hmm. Well, so so you said you went from first grade all the way up to 12th grade. Now, what, what was it you were teaching? What subjects? When I was in the uh, secondary levels, English, uh, mm -hmm. middle school, I did some social studies, but mostly language arts. And in high school, I was an English teacher. Okay. Well, so what, at what moment did you kind of make the decision to move from, uh, from teacher and, and maybe start thinking about going into school leadership? Like, was there a specific kind of event or story around that? No, as I say, I just kind of was, you know, the more I got into my teaching career and, uh, I just thought I could, I don't know, I thought I could make a bigger impact, you know, by, uh, by, you know, and I'd kind of reached that point in my life where maybe, um, you know, I just thought that I could connect with the uh, teachers in the school and, and, and inspire them to make those connections with kids that I'd been trying to make as, in my career as a teacher. And uh, I just kind of wanted to do what I was doing in the classroom from a school level. You know, my, my mantra that I say every day and I tweet out every day is work hard, have fun, be nice. And uh, I tried to do that as a classroom teacher. And I thought if I could take a part of a leadership role and as a school administrator and could get everybody in the building working hard, being nice and having fun each and every day, we'd have a pretty neat school culture. And that was kind of what uh, motivated me to go into school administration to see if I could make an impact on the entire school community hmm. and not just my classroom. So what would you say were some of the challenges that you encountered along the journey to becoming a school leader? You know, along the journey to becoming a, a school administrator, the challenges were just keeping up with um, life, you know, and, and deciding you're going to go back and get your master's and your specialist and, and pursue uh, administrative administrative jobs while you're teaching full time, but to be honest, that wasn't the biggest part of the struggle. I mean, you know, uh, we can do all do that if we put our nose to the grindstone and we manage our time well and we we earn those degrees and earn that certification and eventually earn that first job. And I was in a state that was always you know growing and hiring, so so actually obtaining an administrative job wasn't all that challenging. It was. Uh, 
It was what took place once you got that administrative job and realizing this is a difficult, difficult job. Mm. And I don't think there's any job as hard as being a classroom teacher. It's the most noble and challenging work we can do. But certainly being an administrator is also very, very uh, time consuming, challenging, and requires a lot out of you. And once I got that job, that first assistant principal job, it was an assistant principal of a high school. And at least back then, one you know, if you're a first year administrator, your job tended to be at the high school level discipline. Mm-hmm. And so I spent most of my day dealing with student discipline issues. And that can become overwhelming after a while. And sometimes it can be a, a lonely uh, job. And sometimes it can be a job that challenges you because normally the students who come to your office aren't real happy and uh, the parents, when you call them, they're not too pleased. And sometimes, Jay, you know, as a, as a teacher for most of my life, I was surprised that, you know, I, I went into that knowing I was going to be a big teacher supporter. And uh, I taught for 18 years. I knew how hard it was. And I knew that discipline at the high school level could be tough. And I, you know, I just went into that always knowing I was going to support teachers 100% on any classroom discipline issue. But I I have to be honest, Jay, and say that, you know, I learned, unfortunately, that what was written on the discipline referral form didn't always tell the whole story. And uh, I still always wanted to support that classroom teacher, but sometimes hearing the kid and and listening to their perspective and reading the words on the discipline referral, it didn't always match up. And it just really taught me that there's just – not only two sides to every story, but, you know, um, multiple sides to every story. And I, I think it helped me to become more empathetic and try to see things from every person's point of view and try to really um, put yourself in the shoes of that classroom teacher and in the shoes of that student and try to come to some uh, just decision and consequence for any behavior issues that I was uh, being sent. So, hmm. but lots of challenges in that first year as an assistant principal at the high school and, uh, just learning every day and getting better at what we do and, and growing as a result. Yeah. Well, so what were some, maybe some of the other challenges you encountered, you know, in your first couple of years as, as a leader, I'm, I'm guessing it would just be, you know, it had to be challenging, especially your first day. Cause you get there and you're kind of in this leadership position. Now, did you stay in the school? Were you in the same school or did you get a position at a different school than you'd been teaching at? It was a different uh, district. Okay. And, um, I think that would have been hard for me and maybe hard for other people too, but that would have been hard for me to, to go from a classroom teacher in the, in the school to a principal or assistant principal in that same school. Mm-hmm. It's just a different, different role and, and it's a different lens. And, and gosh, I, I'm, I know other people are probably more humble than I am, but when I was a teacher, I thought I knew it all. And I quickly learned I knew very little about mm-hmm. being a school administrator. So I'm glad at least it was at a different school. Uh, we're at a sort of a fresh start with the people I was working with and hopefully leading a little bit. But, uh, you know, the challenges are, are many. Uh, that that first uh, first year on the job, you know, the time was amazing. Just keeping up with, uh, you know, again, I, I did a lot of attendance and discipline and, and we called student support team work back then uh, for kids who were experiencing behavior or academic difficulties and possibly uh, moving into a 504 or an IEP. And it seemed like uh, it seemed like a lot of my job was um, fraught with some, some negativity, really. All, oftentimes, many of those situations were uh, negative. I, you know, I was meeting with kids who had, had a lot of absences. I wasn't meeting with kids who had perfect attendance. I was meeting with kids who had a lot of uh, behavior referrals and, and who were struggling academically. And, and parents were frustrated by that point of their career. So it, and I tended to be a positive guy and I thought I could solve all problems. And I quickly learned I couldn't and uh, nor should I uh, alone. It required a team. It required collaboration. And it, required communication. So just uh, realizing that problems are real. And uh, although every problem is solvable, it's not always immediately solvable. And it it takes a lot of teamwork and effort and listening and and compassion and empathy. So uh, lots of challenges, but the more challenges there are, the more rewards there are in any job too. So how do you keep yourself in a, in a place where you can be fully present and engaged, enjoy what you're doing and, and just not get discouraged? Because I know that when you're a teacher, I mean, granted, there's plenty of problems, in, you know, you get a chance to experience uh, just students home lives and just different issues when you're, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're a classroom teacher, but then when you kind of 
you know, there's a statement, ignorance is bliss. And I, I feel like when you move into a leadership position, you have a chance to kind of see more of the behind the scenes things that you may not have been aware of before that are going on. And of course, in your situation, when you're kind of assistant principal and your role might have been to deal with some of those trouble issues. So you're confronted with some of the more difficult situations on a frequent basis. Like, how do you keep yourself in a place where you uh, are capable to do that and still keep keep a good attitude, uh, you know, be completely engaged, just be in a good place for those students as they come in or those teachers uh, amidst kind of all the the craziness and, and maybe some of the adverse situations that you're dealing with? Yeah, Jay, good question. Part of it in that job, uh, the first principal, assistant principal job, I remember, uh, and it was something I wanted to do anyway, uh, because as a classroom teacher, I really enjoyed it when principals came into my classroom. You know, oftentimes I was at schools where principals never came into my classroom. I kind of did a good job and they didn't maybe need to, so they so they never did. And that always kind of rubbed me the wrong way. So I, I said going into it that I would be a visible school administrator and that also had another benefit. It kind of uh, uh, got me out of the office where sometimes I was faced with some negativity or just tough situations. And so I think, I think the first and foremost way that, that I... I balance that was by being out and about uh, whenever, whenever I get too consumed with uh, discipline referrals or attendance issues. I would just walk the school and go into classrooms and, and it would re-engage me and re-inspire me to see uh, all these kids. And, and some of the ones I was meeting with in, for discipline referrals, just doing uh, fun things and, and getting along in the classroom. And, and that's where it, it all matters. You know, one of my early mentors was Todd Whitaker, and he's now probably one of my closest friends. And he, he one time said, and this may not be 100% true, but I think uh, the gist of it still makes sense to me. He said, there's nothing you can do in the principal's office uh, during the school hours that can improve the school. And I don't know if that's 100% true, but his point is well taken. If the kids are in the school during the hours of eight and three or whatever it may be at any particular school, I can do a lot more good improving the school by being out and about in the cafeteria, in the gym, in the classrooms than I can uh, in my office. Sometimes, of course, we have to be. But uh, one thing I did, you know, towards that end that Todd, Todd said, anytime I did have like paperwork, and again, we have less and less paperwork now, it'd be more computer, but probably afford more opportunities for this. Anytime I had something where I just had to get some stuff done, I would grab a stack of papers or now I could grab my uh, laptop and I would just go work in a classroom while teaching and learning was going on. Mm-hmm. And at first people would ask, gosh, what are you doing here? And and I would just, I just wanted to sit there and do work where the kids were doing work and where teachers were doing their work. And it was a good way for me to kind of recharge and re-energize and get back to being in the classroom where I'd spent so much of my career. Mm. Yeah, that's such great advice. I feel like whenever you get around other people that, and you get outside of your own head, that things go a lot better, you know, because when, especially when you're dealing with some just difficult issues and maybe like some, you just had this situation and somebody just left your office upset or whatever it is. And uh, if you just kind of, if you spend too much time in your own thoughts, that's really generally not, not that healthy. But when you spend time, you know, around other people and classrooms, just out where, things are going on. It seems like you have a better perspective and you're able to look at kind of situations more objectively that way. Yeah. Spending time with my own thoughts is never a good thing, Jay. So it's always good for me to get out and about and, uh, and again, connecting with kids, you know, you can, you can be, uh, it's, it's a pretty easy trap to fall into. I think for some people to just get consumed with, uh, what's happening in the office and lose sight of the fact of what really matters, which are the kids in our schools. So now you've been in, in school administration for a while, and I'm sure you have just some amazing stories to share of the impact that you've been able to witness and to be a part of. But what's been one of your best moments as a school administrator? You know, uh, I was a principal of the school in Georgia. It's uh, Otwell Middle School in Forsyth County, Georgia. And I think I was principal there for five years. And it, it just became a school that just became a special, special place uh, to, to be. I think both as a student, uh, but certainly as a teacher, administrator. And one thing cool that happened there, in, in Georgia, at least uh, in that county, uh, the teacher of the year was a big thing. And we were a fairly big school district with, I don't know, 30 or 40 schools in the district. And uh, 
once they named the teacher of the year for the school, then they kind of had the countywide teacher of the year and they would narrow it down to an elementary, a middle and a high school teacher of the year. And I remember the first year I was there, uh, one of our teachers won the district teacher of the year. And that was a really great, great thing for us. It was a big honor. And we just consider ourselves a school of master teachers. We just had so many compassion, compassionate, caring teachers who went above and beyond. Um, the bad news was the second year, we kind of knew that our teacher of the year wasn't going to be the district teacher of the year because they would never name it from the same school two years in a row. Well, much to my surprise and gratification, they our, our teacher of the year made it as a district teacher of the year that next year and the year after. Uh, so three years in a row, we had the county teacher of the year at our school. And uh, and I just, I, frankly, I applaud the district for allowing that to wow. happen. I thought it would be rigged where they wouldn't even let that happen. But we were, we felt that that was a great small kind of uh, recognition of what we were all about, which was just really a school of passionate teachers. And and those teachers uh, today, you know, I still remember them as great friends and great teachers, uh, Ronnie McNeese, Melissa Sessa, Mike Sloop, back to back to back county teachers of the year, three of the best teachers I've ever known and three of the best human beings I've I've ever known. And it was quite an honor and kind of made me proud to, to be a principal of a school that had those kind of folks working in it, serving kids. Wow. Now, what do you think lended to that? I mean, for you to have three in a row like that, what do you think brought that all about? You know, it just, a, it was a feeling, it was a culture, you know, that we tried to create. Uh, when I, when I became the principal there, I followed a very, very good and successful principal, but we were very different. And I remember when I got on board there, the first thing I did, and this isn't rocket science, I think a lot of new principals would do this, but over the summer, I met with every staff member, every teacher, every parapro, every food service worker, every custodian. And I just asked them three questions. Uh, what are we really good at? What do we need to get better at? And what can you do to help? And after listening to 100 or so folks kind of answer those three questions and just being a listener, some themes emerged. And uh, one theme that emerged was they they felt that student behavior was not what it could be. And, And so at the beginning of the school year, then I said, hey, we can solve that one. We, we can get our kids to behave better and we can crack down on misbehavior, but we also have to recognize positive behavior. And we, and we just did a ton of things to recognize all the good that was happening with our kids and with our teachers. And it became a, uh, a, a cycle almost of paying it forward. And, and the more we praise kids and we had a positive discipline referral program that we started, and then we started praising each other. And one thing we started was a, uh, I think we called them OMS reports. And we, that was the name of our school, Otwell Middle School. But we also made it stand for observing masterful staff. And once a month, every teacher in that school would observe a colleague just for 10, 15, 20 minutes and, and write a brief reflection. It was just kind of a wows and wonders thing. And uh, But it just sort of broke down the walls of the school and we became a a real community of teachers who work together, I thought, and were collaborative and and not just isolationist, which is easy to go to your own room and close the door. So I don't know. I feel that that spirit of uh, focusing on the positive and focusing on collaboration uh, cultivated a family atmosphere that people wanted to see each other succeed, uh, in addition to obviously seeing their kids succeed. Mm. Yeah, that's really neat. Well, so I, I, you know, I have a few rapid fire questions that I wanted to ask, but before we jump into that, I am curious to just hear more about your writing experience, your, just your experience as an author up to this point. So what was it that inspired you to start on that first book? Which, which book was it that was the first one? And then what kind of brought all that about? Uh, The first book I published, uh, Jay, was improving your school one week at a time. And, uh, you know, I always kind of remember this story. It was in the middle of, uh, well, I always wanted to be a writer. I was actually an English major and I wanted to be a novelist, really. Mm. And uh, so I've written a couple of unpublished novels that are thankfully uh, destroyed at this point, I hope, (laughs) uh, because they were embarrassingly bad. But uh, for whatever reason, I I am a good writer. I've always been a a, a prolific reader and writer. But for whatever reason, I can't write fiction, Mm. even though I always wanted to. And uh, so luckily, I've been fortunate enough to uh, dabble in some uh, professional writing. But I remember that first book, I was 
uh, I was in my office as I was prone to do during my doctoral studies. And every Saturday and Sunday, I I would just drive a couple miles to the school and just work in my office all day long on the dissertation. And I remember one Sunday sitting in that office working on my dissertation at my computer and an email popped up from Bob Sickles, who was the president at that time of Ion Education. And uh, he said, Jeff, Bob Sickles, president of Ion Education, Todd Whitaker recommended that I reach out to you. We need some help with a project we're doing. And he thought you might be able to do it. And, uh, he, he, you know, he described the project. He said they would pay me, I think, $2,500 flat fee. And, uh, and, you know, I was in their office on a Sunday in the middle of my dissertation. It was my first year as a principal. And I was so busy, Jay. And I needed this extra project like I needed a hole in the head, quite <laughs> frankly. And the $2,500 wasn't all that appealing to me uh, based on all the other things I had going on. But I remember I was going to write a book and I sort of had this idea in the back of my head. So I, I responded to him and I said, Bob, I'd be glad to do it if, if you would look at a book that I'm working on. Of course, I wasn't working on it other than in my head. And he said, by all means, I was hoping you'd say that, you know, please share whatever you've got. And uh, so I said, well, I will in about a month or two. And then I had to get this writing project done for him, though. And and I was wondering how I was going to do it. And, and my whole life has been one huge blessing, Jay. But I remember uh, this was a crazy blessing. I, uh, uh, like two weeks later, maybe it wasn't even two weeks later, it might have been the next week, wondering when I would do this writing project for Bob, because um, I had no time. A weird thing happened. There was a water shortage, and they canceled school in our district for two days. Oh, wow. out of the blue. And I used those t- two days to do this project. It happened so uh, serendip- serendipitously uh, that these would be these two random off days. And I finished that project and then got to work on my first uh, book, Improving Your School One Week at a Time, sent that off, sent a draft off to Bob and he sent it off to some reviewers, so pretty positively reviewed. And in 2006, I think is when that book was finally published. So it was an exciting time. And uh, that first book you write, you're always kind of proud of it and excited. And uh, and so that started it. And from there, I've just done a few others and collaborated with Todd and Jimmy Casas and Tom Murray on some other books. And something that I've always uh, enjoyed doing. It's always tough to find the time, but I do like uh, putting my thoughts down and writing and, and seeing them eventually in print, whether it's in a book or in my blog. Well, so how did you navigate that? I mean, how did you find the time, or I guess I should say make the time, because I'm sure you were just overwhelmed with your busy schedule. Uh, I mean, obviously, aside from that, you know, on on an ongoing basis, because obviously you've written several other books since then, or co-authored several books, where do you get the time? Because I know there's people listening right now to this podcast, and they're thinking, they think, you know, that maybe they have a book inside of them. And I feel like everybody probably on some level has a book inside of them, but maybe they're just thinking, you know, with all the crazy stuff I have going on, I'm responsible for this, or, uh, you know, all of these students, all of these teachers, or if they're over an entire district. So how do you do that? Yeah, yeah, that's funny. You know, I've done it a couple of different ways. That first one, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually, I always reflect back on that first one and think I, I need to get back to doing it that way. And I'm kind of admirable of the previous Jeff Zoll that could do it this way because <laughs> I don't do it this way any longer. But that first one, I just made a decision to wake up one hour earlier every day and I would go into the office and I didn't feel guilty because I was I was already came early anyway, but that year I came one hour or earlier every day. And every day I would write for one hour at whatever time that was, some ungodly hour of 5 a.m., I'm sure. And some days I would get a paragraph done. Some days I might get two pages done. Some days I would just reread and revise the pages from the day before. But I just did that every single day for an hour and then on weekends as much as I could. But it was mainly that hour every single day over the course of a year, getting the bulk of that book knocked out. And uh, so that was the first one. But to be honest, lately, it's been more like um, huge, long uh, blocks of time. Uh, the, the short book I wrote for the Corwin series with Tom Murray, I actually uh, checked myself into a hotel room in, uh, in Lake Lure, North Carolina, a place I'd spent some time as a younger man. And I just said, it's a quiet place. I'm going to go back there. And I think I spent three nights there. And I wrote, that was a fairly short book, but I wrote the entire thing 
during the three nights uh, and days that I was staying at the uh, Lake Lure Inn in Lake Lure, North Carolina, because I was just kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. I had to get it done. Uh, longer books, though, uh, like the Start Right Now book, that's a, a full length book. And that one, too, I did in more of a, you know, big blocks of time. And I remember, uh, you know, did, did a lot of it over the summer, Jay, but I remember saying, I'm going to finish this sucker Labor Day weekend. I think, you know, going into Labor Day weekend, I'm kind of estimating I maybe had 40,000 words and it turned out to be about 68,000 words. Mm. And I did the last 28,000 on Labor Day weekend of my part of that book. So, and just, so, so I finally get to a point where I've dragged my feet too long now and I just want to get it done. I focus on big, big blocks of time rather than that first way I did it, which I still want to get back to just doing a little bit every day. Yeah. Well, so which, what's your more recent book, your most recent one? Yeah. The last one came out in February. That was start right now that, uh, I, I kind of finished in rough draft form with Todd and Jimmy. Uh, I put the finishing touches on that last Labor Day, and then it c- came out through a lot of, uh, you know, back and forth from Labor Day on. But I think that came out in print uh, right around February 1st this year, Jay. So which of the books that you have had a chance to author, or co-author, do you think would probably be uh, most applicable for the school leader? You know, uh, they all sort of pertain to that, obviously. Right. Uh, you know, the, the, you know I, the first and the last. Uh, now, if you read Improving Your School One Week at a Time now, it's a little bit dated in terms of the format. It was really just about a first-year principal, my communication with the staff and all the issues we were facing and some of the staff members writing a little bit into the book, too. Uh, but it's really about a weekly uh, teaching and learning fried focus memo I sent out every week. And the book was like 37 chapters long, kind of one for each week of the year. So in some ways it's dated because now most of that's done electronically and through blogging. Uh, but when people read it today, they still say, you know, that the messages in there were inspiring and helpful to me as a principal. Um, so I would say improving your school one week at a time or the last one start right now that in our subtitle for that is teach and lead for excellence. And we tried to kind of write about four behaviors that we think uh, teachers and school administrators have in common. And we kind of call those four behaviors uh, knowing the way, showing the way, going the way, and growing each day. And those really form the bulk of the book, the four main chapters. And we kind of try to give some anecdotes and stories and examples of how both excellent teachers and excellent administrators live out those four behaviors on a daily basis. So I, I, I hope they're practical. I think they are a little bit. We always try to give ideas that we've done that we've seen work or ideas we've seen in other places for principles. So I guess I'd recommend one of those two. So with start right now, what, you know, if uh, a principal picked that up and, uh, and just read through that, what would you hope that they would kind of walk away with after they put it down? Uh, I, you know, I would hope that a principal would um, would walk away with, you know, again, under those four large umbrellas of the four main chapters of the book, they would know first and foremost that people are looking to them. Uh, sure, we're all collaborative leaders, uh, but I just read a post by George Coros the other day. I think it was, it was titled, It's Okay to Be the Boss. You know, sometimes people are looking to you to know the answer and to know the way. And so the first chapter, you know, we, we, we stress that, you know, you, sometimes it's up to you as a leader to take a stand. And, uh, and then that second one showing the way, I, I hope that principals would leave uh, that chapter knowing that it's kind of up to them once they know the way and kind of explain that to people, this is the way we're going, then to really inspire others to join in the journey and to, to share with others how this is going to benefit everybody if we uh, have this shared vision. And that third one, I hope that uh, building principals or administrators would read that chapter. It's called Going the Way. And just really, really remember the power of modeling and how important it is that we model uh, what we expect from others, uh, model for our kids, model for our parents, and model for our teachers. So really walk in the walk and talk in the talk and walk in the walk. And that last one, I hope they would read that and be reminded because I don't think nobody doesn't already know this, but be reminded about how it's so important to grow each day and to keep on learning. And, you know, I just can't believe all that I have learned in my 
18 years as a school administrator, right? And thinking I knew it all back then and kind of think, thinking about that now in somewhat of a horrific, uh, uh, guilty uh, mindset and knowing I knew very little right then. So thank God I kept learning along the way. So I hope they would uh, be able to take a stand, inspire others to join them in the journey. Uh, I hope they would model uh, the way and I hope they would uh, – continue growing and learning and connecting with people on Twitter and social media and within their own communities to get better and better at what they do. Well, so being, you know, obviously once your schedule gets more and more booked up, finding the time to, you know, as Stephen Covey would say, sharpen the saw and just continue to improve. You know, what, what does your routine look like? How do you carve out time to make sure that you're continuing to grow? So for me, again, this does change with me over time, but this probably the most uh, common thing I do is just setting aside, you know, it, it started when for three years I left public education while well, I worked in public schools, but I was a consultant for a nonprofit out of Atlanta, Southern Regional Education Board. And so I traveled 100 percent of the time and that got me into the habit since I was going back to a hotel room pretty much every night without a lot to do uh, other than my work. It got me into the habit of spending 30 minutes every night in that hotel room, getting on Twitter and connecting with people around the world. And to this day, I've tried to kind of keep up that habit, Jay. Uh, I, you know, if I think about it, I almost always have 30 minutes in an evening that I could devote to that. And uh, so that's one way, just trying to carve out just a little bit, but be, being consistent with that. Uh, and it, that always pays off dividends for me that I become inspired by somebody or I find some great resource or, or maybe I connect with somebody and they, and they want to learn from me. Hmm. Um, the other way I try to do that is to be a regular blogger and regular can be as little was once a month, you know, I, I, I used to do every other week pretty religiously and, and now I'm just doing about one a month, but, but just, you know, I hate to use the word force, but almost forcing myself if I, if I need to, to make sure I'm putting some, something out there. Uh, I can't just be a consumer. I've got to be a creator of, of, uh, content too. And, uh, so, and want to model that. So by being a regular blogger and being a regular, uh, Twitter person and participating in Twitter chats and just getting into a kind of kind of a routine where I carve out that time intentionally. Hmm. So where does your inspiration for your blog come from? Is that just kind of like throughout the month you make note of, of kind of things that you might want to write about? Yeah, you know, it is Jay. And usually my blog might be different than other people. Mine, mine tend to be a little bit of s stories or, you know, something I think about. It oftentimes is something I see just when I'm out and about and I kind of make a note of it. Like a lot of people I know, I've got a list of future blog ideas. I've got about always 10 or 20 in the queue and but they usually come just from noticing something uh, probably the blog post that had the most reads was uh, not last year's world cheery world series year for the Cubs I'm a lifelong crazy Cubs fan but the year before when they did real well uh, when Joe Madden was in his first year and I kind of wrote uh, a blog post called uh, why Joe Madden should be a middle school principal and uh, I just kind of compared all the things he was doing with the culture of the clubhouse to the culture of a middle school. And I made a pretty strong case that he would make a pretty good uh, middle school principal. And that got a lot of play. And I think the Tribune even published it uh, here. So that was kind of neat. But they usually come just from ideas I see out in the real world. And that real world can be in our schools that I'm visiting or just when I'm out and about in the real world in the city of Chicago or wherever. Hmm. Well, I'm going to roll through uh, some rapid fire questions if you're ready for those. Sure. So first off, what's the best leadership advice you've ever received? I, I'll go back to uh, Todd Whitaker. Uh, you know, it's all, you know, a lot of people hear this now, but he, you know, when he said it's people, not programs, uh, programs are never the problem and they're never the solution. People are always the problem and they're always the solution. So really focusing on, you know, everybody talks about relationships and that goes without saying how important that is. But I try not to lose sight of that good advice that Todd gave us all way back when. I think in one of his first books, it's people, not programs that will make the difference. And we need to focus on our people. Hmm. What would you say is probably your biggest strength as a school leader? You know, um, over time, I think it's become uh, active listening, and that probably wasn't the case early on. Uh, but uh, someone else gave me some advice to, to listen more than 
something you talk and in school leadership you feel like you have all the answers and you or you should have all the answers and you you tend to talk a lot but i i feel like the older i get the better i get at active listening hmm. and really trying to be empathetic and trying to understand where that other person is coming from and and seeing that if together after listening and trying to understand other people's perspectives if we can come to a, a resolution or a solution or or something that's mutually uh, beneficial yeah so do you have any tips that have or, or tools or anything that have helped you to become more effective at that or is that just kind of been through intentional being intentional and, and just the experience of doing it just being intentional in, in, in doing it, I, you know, so often I, and I, I sit with other great, great leaders, but, but they all like to talk. And, and so do I, Jay, you know, obviously, but, but there's a time to listen. And, uh, and sometimes when I'm around other great leaders who I consider some of the best leaders in the country and I hear them going on and on and on and on, I, I think, gosh, I hope I don't always do this. I hope mm. I stop and listen more. So it's sometimes been from, from listening to people who I really, really, respect and admire as leaders, but just talking it without listening and, and just reminding myself, I can't do that. Sure. If I'm being paid to give a keynote speech, I'm going to talk a lot. But if, if I'm just trying to problem solve with an individual or a group of folks, uh, I want everybody to have an equal voice at the table. Right. Well, and obviously all of your books, uh, would definitely be thing, you know, books that I'd recommend. And I'll put those in the show notes for people who are listening. Uh, you know, aside from those, the books though, that you've had a chance to author or co-author, uh, which everyone should go out and get and read. Are there any, is there maybe another book or two that have made a big impact on you that you'd recommend for other school leaders? You know, I try to read a lot of books just on leadership in general that aren't education specific. And uh, the first one of those that comes to mind right away is The Leadership Challenge, which probably is considered one of the seminal uh, leadership books ever written. It's in its who knows how many editions now, but been around for 25 years and probably five or more editions. Uh, but by Jim Cousins and Barry Posner, uh, The Leadership Challenge. Uh, getting back to education, I do think that George Koros's book, uh, The Innovator's Mindset, is one of the best educational books I've read in the past decade. Um, I'm a big fan of the Heath brothers, Chip and Dan Heath, Made to Stick. Um, was always a, one of my favorite books. I like their acronym for uh, what it is that makes ideas stick. And I think that's particularly useful to uh, classroom teachers and getting their ideas to stick in the classroom. So those would be a few. I'm a big Pat Lencioni fan, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team and mm. The Advantage and other books that he has written. So those are a few. Right. Well, so what advice would you have for a school administrator as far as working with the students that they serve? You know, uh, to not lose sight of that, to, to always be with the kids, um, to to be in classrooms, to participate in the lesson, to walk into the gym and get caught up in a in a physical activity that's happening in a gym class, to uh, to be to be among them, to sit down. I worked with one principal; she was awesome. My first uh, principal when I was assistant principal at the elementary school. Uh, and every day she she ate lunch every day, and uh, every day she would just sit down with a different child in the cafeteria. And just talk to the kids, and uh, and I, I just really admire that. Uh, and she had to eat lunch anyway, and she it just it was really neat that she would do that every single day with a different child in our school. So not, never never lose sight of uh, the fact that that's why we're all here, and and that's where the fun is, you know. And uh, you know, again, I'll go back to working hard, having fun, being nice every day, making sure that uh, you're with kids and modeling hard work and having fun and being nice to people. So kind of along those lines, what one piece of advice would you have for a school administrator as far as working with the other teachers? You know, as far as working with other teachers, it's it's rolling up your sleeves and, and doing the work with them. And uh, and again, I think, you know, even though I taught for 18 years, uh, pretty quick, once you become an administrator, you're no longer the content expert those teachers are. I'm a big believer in professional learning communities done right and focusing on results and focusing on learning and focusing on collaboration. But but at times just sitting alongside them and not being there to provide answers, but, you know, to brainstorm with them and, and to ask questions and to, to look at the data and see where that leads and just try to be one of the team members, not always uh, 
being the the team leader, but a team member. Hmm. Well, so the last question I have, if you had a time machine and you could jump in it and go back to the point in time when you first made the decision to go into school administration, what advice would you go back and give to that younger version of yourself? Oh uh, gosh, you know, uh, you know, there's a Maya Angelou quote, right? It's, uh, do, I won't say it right, but uh, do the best you know how to do until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. Um, and that's good advice. You know, I, I thought I knew it all and I made a lot of mistakes along the way. But the important thing for me to remember when I do beat myself up or when any of us beat ourselves up, most of us that I know are doing the best we know how today. It might not be the best we know how two weeks from now even. But today, as I sit here, I'm doing the very best I can do today. And, and that's about all I can do. Um, but then it's also important to, to not lose sight of the fact that I can get better. Uh, but to get better, I've got to connect with other people. I've got to read more. I've got to, I've got to be more visible. I've got to experience things. I've got to travel to new places. And, and then sure enough, if I do all those things at some point down the road, whether it's two weeks or two years from now, I'll know better. And at that point, it'll be incumbent upon me to do better. So uh, to, to not beat yourself up too much when you make mistakes, but not let yourself off the hook either for getting better next time around. Yeah. Yeah. Something that I share with the team members uh, frequently with my team members is just, you know, it's okay to make mistakes. Let's just make new ones. Yeah. 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 I like that. Well, so finally, if one of our listeners wants to reach out to you after the show, what would be the best way to connect with you? Oh, probably uh, through Twitter and my Twitter handle, which is at Jeff underscore Zoll. Uh, certainly email Jeff Zoll at gmail.com is fine, too. Um, always happy to connect with new folks. Well, Edge Leaders, this has been a fantastic interview today. For the show notes of today's show and other resources, visit educatorslead.com and type the word Jeff into the search tool to find his show notes. Jeff, thank you for sharing your journey with us today. Jay, thank you so much. Really appreciate the opportunity. And that wraps up another episode of Educators Lead. This podcast is brought to you by Mometrics, the number one test preparation company. Mometrics offers study materials for over 1,800 different exams, including the SAT, ACT, GED, end of course exams, state standard exams like the STAR, teacher certification exams, advanced placement, CLEP, ASVAB, GRE, and so many more. Mometrics takes the mountains of information students could be tested over for any given exam and boils it all down to just the fluff-free golden nuggets of information that are most likely to be on the exam. They couple that with some great study tips and test-taking strategies to help students maximize their test scores. With their interactive tutorial videos and a layout that makes lesson planning easy, Mometrics study guides, flashcards, and practice questions are a great fit for individual or classroom use. To learn more about our products and our vault of hundreds of free tutorial videos, please visit educatorslead.com forward slash test prep. That's educatorslead.com forward slash test prep. Edu leaders, thank you for joining us on Educators Lead. Visit us at educatorslead.com for everything we talked about today, free resources, and much, much more. 